Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on disrupting finance flows um, around research and innovation in the humanitarian system. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're looking forward to having a really dis productive discussion this morning. Just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Jess Camburn, and I'm the chief executive of an organization called ELRA, and we work on funding and supporting research and innovation in the humanitarian system. But today's discussion is not about us, it's about the wider system. So let me just briefly, um, for those of you who are engaging in the ALNOP session for the first time, let me just briefly um, get you up to speed with this session uh, as part of the wider Al ALNAP meeting. The ALNAP meeting is looking at learning emerging from disruption. Now we know that disruption creates fertile ground for learning as organizations and individuals adapt their approaches to changes that are happening around them. But we also know from experience that human the humanitarian system, in the humanitarian system, particularly transformational change, may have more to do with the influence of external forces than the ones that we try and plan to shift ourselves. So in this discussion, we're gonna be considering the issue of funding flows and more specifically the funding of research and innovation in humanitarian crises and the extent to which significant disruptions such as the World Humanitarian Summit localization agenda, the global pandemic and discussions around decolonization have given rise to new learning over the last 18 months. So this session is one of disrupting humanitarian practice and part of the wider ALNAP series during this, um, that's going on over the next few days. If you're interested in the, the wider theme and the other sessions, please do look at the agenda and there's some really great sessions that you might want to join. So before I introduce my panelists, I'm just gonna ask you to um, respond to one particular poll on Slido. And we'd like to ask you the following question. What do you think is the most significant barrier preventing funding reaching local institutions? And I think there are some options for you to review and to vote against. While you're considering that, I'd like to introduce our four brilliant panelists that we have here today who are gonna help us to start this conversation. So firstly, we have Dr. Gloria Seruagi. It's Gloria is a behavioral scientist at Makerere University in Uganda. And she has over 15 years of experience in policy and health systems, working with disadvantaged, vulnerable and marginalized populations in reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, adolescent health and nutrition. And she's gonna really help us to get a perspective of working with the current funding system. Next, we have Emily Coombe Besson, who is a research fellow in humanitarian health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Emily is currently working on mort mortality estimation in crisis affected settings. She's a scholar activist and she's a founding me member of the Fighting Against Institutional Racism Network at London School. Then we have Takeshi Komino. Takeshi is the Secretary General and a member of the Executive Committee for Asian Disaster, Re Disaster Reduction and Response Network and a focal point for the ADRRN Tokyo Innovation Hub. Takeshi also serves as General Secretary of CWS Japan and the Co-Chairperson of Japan Platform. And then finally, our fourth panel member is Jenny Hodgson. Jenny has been the Executive Director of the Johannesburg-based Global Fund for Community Foundations since it was established in 2006. Based in various locations globally, Jenny has been involved in philanthropy development in emerging markets and developing context for the past two decades. And I'm hoping you're gonna find that our four panelists have really got some exciting and interesting perspectives for us to get into this conversation. So a big welcome to my panelists. I'm now gonna have a quick look at what you've come up with um, in the Slido. So uh, we've asked you what the biggest barrier um, to, to accessing financing for local actors is. And quite clearly there's a very strong uh, dominant barrier which is unequal power dynamics, which I think is very related to some of the conversations and perspectives we're gonna explore with our panelists, but lots of other feedback as well. So that's a really useful starter for our discussions. I'm going to now give you a little bit of context for why we think this, uh, this discussion is important and why ELRA particularly has been passionate about having this conversation with you. So in 2016, ELRA undertook research to try and produce a global map of where research and innovation funding was being invested in the humanitarian system. That research would produce many interesting findings, but one of the most pertinent was at the start pitch that the majority of funding was coming from donors that were based in the global north, and primarily they were giving their funders to actors that also came from the global north. And actors and, and research institutions that were based in countries and regions that were affected directly or close to humanitarian crisis were generally not getting a look in and not able to access the funding that was available. And I'm sure we all agree in this session that that's not the funding profile that we'd want for the humanitarian system. However, 
disrupting it is a challenging task. And there is often what we feel like overlapping barriers that make change feel pretty insurmountable um, and a very long, long task for us to achieve. But we do think that change can be achieved with, with deliberate investigation and looking for models or signs that can help us to see a way forward. So we're going to try and uh, help us structure our conversation around a model that we've created just to help us dive into this question. A famous statistician once said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So with that saying in mind, we're not proposing our model is perfect, but the model on the slide is intended to help us orientate ourselves into what is a very complex discussion, which does have many different possible perspectives. So in the model, when it, when it does come up, if everyone's uh, okay to wait for that, we have a series of three loops. Um, and we borrowed our thinking from the concept of learning loops, single, trip, uh, double and triple learning loops, that help us to question wider um, embedded practices and rationales that feel unchangeable, as well as kind of helping us think through the concept of participatory design paradigms and how we might change together a system that everyone engages in in different ways. So in our model, uh, whenever, whenever it's up, we have the initial circle, the first loop, and that's really looking at current funding practices um, that exist within Northern institutions, such as my own, like ELRA. And we first look at, uh, question the kind of way that we're currently providing grant funding and think about, could we change that system to make it more equitable to shift those power dynamics? What are the barriers within the current practices that could be transformed? Then we're gonna zoom out to the second loop and question, the role of grant funders in, in the Global North and whether we could look for different types of, types of partnerships where we could devolve and decentralize the power away from the centers in the Global North. And then in the third loop, um, we question the whole existence of funders in the Global North and whether they actually do have a role to play. And if so, how can we transform that? So actually um, we're supporting local driven leadership. Now, we recognize obviously that language around Global North and Global South are highly imperfect um, and you know, we can criticize them and take them apart. What we're generally trying to get at is the fact that funding tends to at the moment come from Europe, North America and Australia for research and innovation, although that is changing. Um, and generally it's not going to countries that are based where humanitarian crisis are, which broadly categorized in the Global South, but appreciate that many people have, might have problems with that language. Um, as ELRA is a UK Global North grant funder, we primarily to seek to acknowledge that the, the uneven power dynamics within the system that we are part of, um, and we are either helping to perpetuate, but we'd like to be able to be part of a solution helping to change the system as it currently exists. Um, and ideally we'd like to see funding mechanisms that enable researchers and innovators in the Global South to design programs themselves that respond directly to identified needs and to be the primary recipients of funding that comes into the humanitarian system. And we want to understand what our role and what the role of others like us might be in supporting that transformation. So we want to dive into some of the barriers and understand them a bit more. Disruptive change requires a shift in how funding is structured and in our current culture and practices. So through our brilliant panelists, we're going to hear about the problem first. What is it like at the moment? How are we finding, how are people finding the, the use of the current funding models? Um, and then we're going to zoom out a bit and have a look at some examples that might give us a sort of signpost of different ways of working, different solutions that might be available to us. New and different models are emerging and we're excited to hear about them and we want to hear more. And we feel that you, our audience, may have a great knowledge of some exciting approaches that we could learn more about. So that's what we're going to be diving into in our breakout to try and spot and think through some models that might give us a route towards change. Uh, so that uh, that is the sort of setup for us. Um, I hope did the model come up, everybody? I'm not, yes, there we are. Very small, but hopefully you can see the three loops that we're talking about there. Um, I'm going to now invite our first speaker, Gloria, to, to kick us off. So Gloria is going to really help us to understand what it's like uh, to try and apply and use the current funding system from her perspective as a, a leading academic at Macquarie University. Gloria, welcome, and I'm very much uh, looking forward to your words. Over to you. Thank you, Jess. That was a very good introduction. And hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. My topic was uh, on the topic I'm supposed to talk about is on why why funding should go to low and middle income actors rather than actors from the global north and the current barriers. Uh, first, let me say that on a personal level, I think actors in the global north have made remarkable contributions with the access that they've had, and they still definitely need those resources. 
And I think focus should be more on improving and expanding access to funding, disrupting this access and the power balance as uh, was already shared in the slide, um, rather than not really giving the north, especially in some of the situations where we find that actors from the global north might be more eligible or even need inclusion in those. So why should funding go to low and middle income actors? Um, why should more funding really go there? I think the very first thing is the moral imperative um, and the need to have very you know, fair access and equity. And this is in the face of a lot of barriers, some of which are structural, some of which are historical, political, and so on. But then the times in which we live currently, we all know how the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted um, everything that we do and uh, highlighted more need for localization and the need to foster system resilience, build capital, basically to strengthen systems and make them more robust. And lo localization is very critical here. And then we know that low and middle income actors, they you know, they, they, they know better the localized, effective and sustainable solutions to their own problems. And then they also have the potential to actually grow and uh, establish themselves um, as innovators, as leading researchers, and then be able to favorably compete at the global stage. It might require initial affirmative, some sort of affirmative action, um, but they do have the potential. And because of that, we think more funding should really go to them. Um, but then also we are seeking equity and, and um, balance. Equality might never be achieved, as we all know, but some form of equity. Um, so if we did that, if more um, access to funding um, was extended to them, I think we might be able to um, achieve that through um, some of the new partnerships or even consolidated partnerships with the uh, global north actors, but this time being led um, from the south uh, and, and so on. So um, I think it will it will need a lot of investment. It will, you know, it will have to be intentional action. And then, um, the, of course, the recognition of these barriers, which are, I would, I would say they have two angles to them. One of the angles is that the barriers are multifaceted in a sense that uh, they are, they can go from uh, personal barriers to institutional team barriers. There are also intellectual inequalities and barriers there social culture, is even the unconscious bias of those awarding funding. But then the other angle is that these barriers are faced um, across the different stages of the funding cycle, right from framing the funding calls to the impact of these calls. Now, as these stages, uh, right from framing the calls, um, selection, awarding, and so on, as the stages come along, a lot of more and more potentially deserving LMIC actors continue to follow which perpetuates this cycle of them not being ineligible for that particular funding opportunity, but also those ones in the future. Um, so the actual barriers, uh, much as they are, as I said, they are multifaceted, they are also phased in approach. Um, they include constraints uh, around donor requirements. First of all, the funders usually also have their own funders and some of their requirements are passed on to uh, people like us who are the grantees and uh, most of these happen a lot in the early stages of the, of the cycle uh, when the calls are being framed when the due diligence is being applied and that's usually the pre-award stage and then some of these calls obviously have um, some requirements which might be very difficult to um, to achieve uh, for example if they say that um, a, you know an institution in the global south should have a partner in the north, uh, it's very difficult to do that sometimes in a short time. Um, and then more importantly, actually sometimes this just serves to extend privilege and discrimination because some actors in the global south are really extensions of the northern actors. And uh, you know, they will continue um, taking the, you know, the leading spots and leaving a lot of others not um, having this access that, that we seek. Um, and and, and, and I, I speak this as a, Staff and faculty at Macquarie University. I know that Macquarie is one of those relatively advantaged institutions, but even then, uh, Macquarie has a lot of different colleges, schools, and, and departments which are at different levels in terms of capacity. So that needs to really be um, understood. Um, so, privilege basically also exists in these South institutions. And so, um, as we speak about disrupting funding and expanding access and equity uh, and so on, I think the end result or the outcome of this needs to be very clear. Um, are we just uh, consolidating or um, um, pushing forward the giants, the, even the southern giants, 
uh, all are we really going for those really fragile institutions or teams that currently have limited capacity or limited uh, visibility in terms of institutional teams or individuals. I think that needs to be really spelled out and I'm looking forward to what people will have. Um, then of course, another barrier is the language and optics around you know, having do these institutions or teams um, have media presence? Do they have a digital footprint? Um, do they use the right language? The knowledge is uh, not equal. Um, are they using the right words and so on in the proposals and reporting? Generally, the weak capacity for a lot of teams and institutions has been a major barrier, and um, it doesn't even help that there is generally limited support for some of these teams to reflect after after the funding cycle, after the work has been done, the innovation or the research. Um, and, 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 and there is less capacity for leveraging technology or even limited media presence. Even when these teams are really doing great work on ground, there are some other subtle um, biases which, which serve as barriers. It could be social, cultural, moral, political, and so on. And I'm just going to use my own example. I come from Uganda, and we generally oh, yeah. have a reputation for corruption, uh, violation of human rights, poor governance, and you know, homophobia. Some people might have come across that. Now, uh, and then also being very religious. The chances of a researcher who has only studied from a less known Ugandan university who has no northern connections and is working at a, Christ, at, you know, at a, at a university. We have a university called Uganda Christian University. Such a researcher, for example, applies for funding, their chances are really, really, really slim. So the question is, can researchers be seen, can they be assessed or supported on merit and not entirely on the affiliation of their institutions or their country and all these other biases that we have Thanks, implementation? But my time is up, right? We're very, yes, but I don't want to interrupt you too much. So just if, it, yeah, if we're close to finishing up, that'd be really helpful. Sorry, apologies. No, no, no it's fine. I'm actually coming to the very end. <laughs> Pretty much, um, yeah, there are these implementation barriers that have timelines and, and realities that when implementing some of these projects for which funding has been acquired, I think it can lead sometimes to poor evaluation and assessment scores, which again reduces chances of more funding. And then last but not least, um, of course, there's a support for publication and wider dissemination in critical fora. Um, for researchers, it's mostly those high ranking journals, the impact factors and so on, but access to this is also very difficult as I I said once already if your chances of getting the funding is hard even um, um being able to go in this global fora and, and showcase your work it's even harder so um so then actors are not able to demonstrate impact or even reach even when they've had a lot of local impactful engagement with uh, probably the local stakeholders who matter the most so in conclusion i mean despite all these barriers we have hope and uh, beginning to realize this uh need to extend more funding is a significant step in the right direction might take time but it's a great um step to begin so thank you anna and partners for for giving this important subject consideration and time for us to discuss thank you back to you jess Thank you very much, Gloria. And my goodness, there's a lot in there for us to unpack and discuss a lot of issues. But uh, really, I think you've just set the scene of how big a challenge we have and how many different parts of work we're going to have to address. But thank you, Gloria. I'm now going to shift to our next speaker, Emily, who's been undertaking some really interesting research about the way that the current Northern institutions are operating and some of the power dynamics that may be expressed through the way that we work. So Emily, welcome and over to you for your, your speech. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. So first, I want to say that, um, like, I think before starting and explaining everything, it's very important to understand also the background of like my background as a speaker. Um, I'm an African woman, but like I've grown up in a Western environment and I've worked in different African countries, and now I'm working in a Western institution. So, I think my perspective on those issues is very sometimes different. And like my approach from like, people who have been working in country and they've been like recipient of those fundings and all the things. So really the work we've been trying to do recently was to try to understand uh, why are those imbalances coming from? And, um, and so while discussing this, we really started thinking about the notion of like knowledge inequity. It's really that idea that right now, due to different legacies and inherited like structures, we really think about Western knowledge as the way, as like superior knowledge. We think about it in terms of, this is how things should be done. So obviously, like when we 
when we discuss internationality and like disrupting those structures, there's two approaches. One would be to say, okay, we really want like LMIC institution to operate and work as Western institutions. So we need to be very much more intentional about it and say, this is the type of diploma that you need. This is a type of um, structure that you need. This is the type of norm. This is a type of financial practices and all things. But if we really go into like the current movement of decolonizing global health and um, everything, then it's another approach. It's about recognizing those ongoing like structures and differences and systemic differences that are actually acting as a barrier for LMIC researchers. So some of the solution that we started uh, discussing with ERA and other donors were first around the terminologies of the cause. So right now we use terminologies like global health and humanitarian, but without recognizing that they are by definition exclusionary. When you are a public health actor in Uganda or in Cameroon, where I'm originally from, I, you don't think about yourself as a humanitarian actor or global health actor, but somehow having a diploma, for me, having a diploma from glo a global health diploma, I can apply to position in these countries and be seen as an expert on an issue that I'm not directly impacted by. So just like think about that terminology and understanding how those terminologies are being, dis are being created and they really what they really reflect is the distance of the people from the issue that we're trying to address. Um, then we think also about the notion of knowledge. Very often in call for proposal, um, there is that requirement to um, be generalizable and like have a finding that would impact like other contexts. The reality is like, if you work on COVID in the UK, you're never being expected to have findings and like do a research that would also benefit like France or the US and all things. And so it's very a mindset that is very complicated and like it's very, it's kind of, there's a disconnect in like the expectation of having contextualized and uh, fit for purpose uh, responses and like at the same time being expected to be generalizable in the knowledge that like they are asked to create. And so while donors have the right to decide that they want to have like knowledge that is contextualized and like that is generalizable, that needs to be very clear in the expectation because what happened very often is like the reviewer would see um, a proposal and think, oh, this is not appropriate because actually we've already seen that research being done in another country. But does it really matter if this research is gonna have an impact in this space? Does it matter that it's already been done somewhere else? We don't know. So, but that's the question. And like, in order to address that, you really almost think about the reviewer's diversity. And by diversity, like I said, I really wanted to highlight that I am an African woman, but at the same time, my training means that sometimes I'm way more likely to think in terms of like the way Western people are doing things. And so is it ethical of me to review a proposal from, I don't know, um, Bangladesh, what do I understand about the Bangladeshi context? How, what do I know about the way they're doing things, the way they are allocating funds, the way they are um, doing their funding mechanism and all the things. So either I know about the context or I have a very, I'm very, sorry. So either I'm very intentional <laughs> about the way that I want to do that review. And so that way, that's what we think about reviewer diversity. The last thing that I will talk about very quickly is about experience. I think local, like when we talk about localization and all things, we talk a lot about, we want to uh, acknowledge lived experience and want to like, have actors in countries and all things. But the reality is the tool that we're using right now don't allow us to actually capture lived experience. Like if you look at a resume, for example, it's very easy as a Western person, even for me to say, I have experience in research because I'm paid to do research. How many people in LMIC are actually paid to do research? And some of them do research, but like they do it on their own terms or even like, having experience working in a community. Yes, if you're, again, from a Western background, you can go and actually pay money to go and do volunteer work somewhere. But if you are from the community and you work with people around you and you have those organized um, activities, 
this is the same level of experience, but like it's very, it's much harder to be able to put it on the resume and really make it valuable. So I think it's very the responsibility of the funders to work with the people or really just be intentional about how do we understand if the experience and how do we value it? And then also think about there are some existing structural in, like imbalances when it comes to, like I said, being paid to do research having experience in like managing grants. I don't think those should be act as barrier. And right now they do. And when in fact you can use the fundings in order to level up. So including like fundings for training on management, on project management or all the things are ways to address those imbalances. And I'm done. Go ahead. Wow. Emily, thank you. Well done. <laughs> Great timing. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so much in there that's really thought provoking, I think for a lot of us. So. I really enjoyed hearing your perspectives on these issues. Thank you. Um, we are now, I'm, apologies to the audience, we're running slightly over time, but I think hearing from our speakers, um, it's, it's not the speaker's fault, it's my fault for mismanaging the start of this, uh, but I do think it's really important we hear from our speakers before we go into our breakout sessions. So I'd like to invite our next uh, speaker, Takeshi, who's gonna uh, talk about a, a, a way that he is working with actually us and other global funders to support uh, innovation in a kind of regional perspective and, and thinking through how we might work differently through actors such as um, his organization. Takeshi, please, over to you. Thank you, Jess. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for joining our session. I have three points to make. Um, one is about localization. What does it mean for us? And two is about the process oriented approach. And the three is about the journey. Uh, I'll explain one by one. So about the localization for uh, the network that I represent ADRN, localization is, uh, is a key aspiration to achieve actually. It's necessary uh, in order to achieve our vision. Um, we would like to transform this Asian region into the most resilient region um, by 2030. And localization is not only about the money issue, but it's um, enabling leadership, local leadership and governance to take key decisions um, which are supported from outside. And therefore, to us, the local stakeholders should not merely be an applicant but they should be considered as those who strategize and co-create the plans together. Um, in our working model uh, in the field of innovation, we work with uh, country focal points who have uh, significant authority over program design, selection criteria, due diligence process, and creating that uh, ecosystem for locally led innovation. And, um, and it, it includes having the locally relevant criteria for selection and due diligence with verification and support provided at the regional level. And also uh, technical reviews in our innovation programs are done by various professionals in country. So that's about the localization. And two, uh, my second point on the process oriented approach. To us, process is important, maybe as equally important as the product. Um, as it determines how the innovation ecosystem is created or not created and sustained or not sustained. Um, there are learnings throughout the process. And I think adaptive management approach with key principles of respecting the local aspirations would be a key. Um, where we work, those we work together on locally led innovation work uh, puts the theme of innovation in their organizational strategy, for example, um, and create the necessary partnership with government and private sector, academia, and other professional institutions, not because they're told to do so, but because they figure out the genuine needs to do so. So locally led approach with that process oriented mind to us is an important uh, element. And lastly, on my third point about the journey, um, and this is one of the key learning that I have also in um, going through this journey with you, Jess and the ERA team, um, that, that I think we should not treat these uh, innovation intervention as projects, but it's a journey um, from the rigorous problem analysis, um, you know, having that ownership locally. Uh, to search and the research for digging into the issues further, 
you know, ideation and prototyping, pilot and scaling. It's a journey with lots of learning and pivots, you know. And this uh, journey needs to be supported, not only the ideas. Uh, so it's the process that needs to be supported, not only the product. So I, I think this is a mind shift because when we work with the sort of call for proposal approach, we're calling for ideas. But in order for people to get to that idea stage, there are lots of rigorous analysis that they have to do, uh, the partnership that they have to create, you know, some of the transformation that they have to go through. That's, it's a process. And for us, that process needs to be supported. And, and I think it's the mind shift, mindset shift uh, required for this uh, locally led innovation. And, and lastly, the question is, you know, in, in, in a journey like this, what's the indicator for success? You know, I think it's something for all of us to think about. Thank you. Oh, back to you, Jess. Oh, I fell foul of the Zoom mute problem. Thank you so much, Takeshi. That's really great question to finish uh, your session on for us to, to think about um, for a later session. Now, our final speaker, um, is Jenny. And Jenny actually is um, from a sector that's slightly outside of uh, the humanitarian sector, but had a really fascinating model that we were really hoping to learn from that might be relevant to, to the way that we work. So Jenny, I'll, I'll pass over to you to introduce that. Thank you so much. Um, and hi, everybody. Great to be here. Yes, as Jess says, uh, the work that I'm going to talk about really has um, well, we've either been out in the wilderness or at the party you all want to be at, and that's for you to determine. But over the last 16 years, my organization has worked to identify and support and build up a network of organizations who I would say were doing development differently. Um, we've used the lens and framing of community philanthropy. Um, and most of the organizations we work with are themselves um, community proximate or community based grant makers. So they have the grant making capacity, but they're also talking about and appreciating local resources and local assets. And the assumption being that if you really want to build local ownership and direction and power, you need to appreciate the resources that exist within communities. And I think it's something that the development system has been really bad at. It's only assumed that its money will do the thing. And yeah, sure, there's other stuff out there, but has never really thought about how external money can really leverage local resources. And by way of an example, um, Tewa, the Nepal Women's Fund, has been around for 25 years. It was set up 25 years ago to be a very different creature premised around women's rights and gender equity, but also the existence and the mobilization of local resources. So Tewa has a network of 5,000 people across Nepal who give, give small amounts, but give nonetheless. So that idea, and I think within the humanitarian space, I see reports that sort of go, oh, and then there's other stuff out there that we can't see. In a sense, the work that we've been doing over the last um, 16 years has been trying to make visible this ecosystem of local actors, structures, mechanisms, which are premised on the idea of participation, distribution of power. Maybe local groups need only $100, $150. Maybe they don't need to be able to receive huge amounts of money. Maybe that would destroy them. So these institutions that are really building local ecosystems in the, in the context in which they're operating. And what's been interesting is in the last couple of years, well, last five or six years, I'd say, is starting to see the emergence of interest from some of the bilateral funders, such as the Dutch government, the EU, USAID, trying to think about how can we better see what is already there and how can we ensure that our resources build on it and don't get in the way. So in terms of sort of data and research, I think from the beginning, we have seen the research and academic structures around development aid to be a huge barrier. The, you know, the historic legacies of who studies what and whom and how it is funded. So we've done a couple of things that I want to talk about, which have really tried to kind of um, build an accompanying narrative and evidence base, which has been shaped and framed by the people that we work with around the world. So firstly, through our grant making, and we've made grants, quite small grants, um, to partners in 200 partners in 70 countries, we've collected demographic data to say, well, what does this emerging field look like? What do these organizations do? Where do they get their money from? Who do they make grants to? What's their structures look like? But we've also deliberately used social capital indicators to try and understand what is the agenda here? And you could have a women's fund in Uruguay, a community foundation in Mexico, um, 
a local grant maker in Zambia, and they could all be working on different kinds of things, but the underlying principles that seem consistently to recur across their work is that these are organizations that are building assets, including local philanthropy, local cultures of giving, but also other kinds of assets, assets in the terms of knowledge and relationships and other kinds of things that exist in communities. So these organizations are building assets. They are deliberately using grant making as a strategy to strengthen local ecosystems. They are not intermediary grant makers at a time when the localization agenda is hungry to find mechanisms through which it can wish its vast amounts of money. These organizations have the ability to form, perform that function in many instances, but it is not their function to deliver on someone else's agenda. So they are about strengthening the capacities and agencies of community. And thirdly, their agenda is about building trust, building trust within communities, between partners they work with. So bonding, bridging and linking social capital. And that linking social capital also, I think, is really critically important when it comes to building trust between Southern actors and global civil society and funders, because in many cases, it's not there. There's a sort of language of solidarity and togetherness, but actually in practice, you know, Southern actors consistently feel excluded. So the other thing, so we, we've, drawn, we've developed an evidence base where I would say we measure what matters. And secondly, in how we've done some of our research ourselves, we've done some practitioner-led research. For example, we did a piece a couple of years ago on defining community development from the perspective of community. So normally it often gets, uh, it's described by INGOs. This is a community development, a community-led development approach. So this, this research, which was understanding what community-led looks like, led by a network of six of our partners around the world who had long-term relationships and were based in communities. Basically talking to people saying, how do you know if something's community-led or not? And really allowing other voices that aren't normally captured to be genuinely heard. Um, and to try and start to bring that, that, that the edge voice, which is still so missing. If you ask somebody what community-led is still, we're conditioned to say, this is what community-led looks like because I've read it in, the, in all the books kind of thing. So I think we've really tried to sort of navigate around trying to build an ecosystem based on relational power, an, an, an appreciation of power, a critique of the current system, but also using evident and emergent learning and practice to build this alternative system. And it's an alternative system that in my view, the development and humanitarian system misses at its leisure. So I, I think the importance of putting on the right frames on your glasses, the right lenses on your glasses to be able to see the thing that the system and the localization agenda is looking for is a critically important bridge that we still need to cross. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much, Jenny. A really inspiring model for us to think about. I think the thing, one of the things you said which really stood out for me was look and find out what is there and build on that. And I think that's so telling for us in the research and innovation community. There is a huge amount of <laughs> capability and capacity in research and innovation, and, and we need to be finding ways to build on that um, rather than um, superseding it. Thank you very much. There's lots to think about there. Um, we are running slightly over time, everybody, but hopefully we'll be able to catch up. We're about to shift now into our breakout sessions by some technical wizardry, which I'm not involved with. Um, and we're gonna be looking at, uh, following the, the conversation we've just been having and listening to, thinking deeper about what disruptive practices or models you are aware of or are involved with that you think might give us a signal of a new way forward for us. Um, so we really wanna hear from you. What, what excites you? What have you seen that could be a, helping us find a different way of working? And we want to get your experiences there. Um, thank you, everyone. And apologies if anybody had a few issues getting into the rooms and, and navigating their, their way to the right group. Uh, but I think in the end, we had some very rich discussions from certainly from the conversation I joined. It was uh, really rich and, and very thought provoking. So we've got a bit of time now um, to hear briefly um, from we ended up only having two discussion groups I'm aware. Um, so we have a bit more time for each of those groups to feed back if they'd like it on, on the kind of the top point from their discussion. And I'd like to start with breakout group one, and I'm not sure from that group who is feeding back, but over to you. Um, so the key key sort of message is, uh, what are we trying to achieve? Um, are we trying to achieve the sort of the system change um, or are we trying to run the status quo? So being clear on the, what are we trying to achieve? And there are three sort of concrete examples that our colleagues have shared. One, one came from, uh, 
uh, our CHS Alliance colleague uh, that you know they're they're having the, um, lots of these translation of CHS uh, uh, the standard document into many different uh, local languages and these local language and local knowledge and how to integrate that in translation of CHS is really a key and I fully agree because I've been I've myself uh, were involved in translating CHS into Japanese language before and I fully agree it's not really straightforward it re requires that sort of linking wisdom from local um, culture and practice uh, into these uh, translating of English languages you know so um, so that sort of thinking and practices are being being done uh, by our CHS Alliance colleague the other example was uh, uh, an example flagged by our ALNAP colleague um, about these regional innovation programming and creating these funds for local actors by international humanitarian actors. And the one example was given about the locust response uh, recently last year um, and given these more flexible funding for local actors to come up with solutions uh, to the problem. And the third example that our colleague gave was from the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, societies. Um, and they're having this global push on the collaborative model that focus on learning. So setting the learning agenda, not only for one uh, Red Cross uh, part of the family, but with other partners, uh, create that learning agenda at the onset of either a project or strategy um, and advocate that collaborative approach to their donors. Uh, so that they can have the buy-in uh, in their in their ecosystem. If other colleagues have uh, points to add, please feel free. Thank you, Takeshi. I think unless there's anything from your group, that's a really great set of uh, examples and ideas for, for what could bring about change. So thank you. Really, really great to capture all that. And we are capturing that both on the mirror board and in the notes we're taking. Um, right, we're going to shift to group two, which was a really interesting conversation. Um, and Emily, I believe you're, you're feeding back for us. Yeah. Um, so in our group, we talked a lot about, we took the approach of like changing the system and uh, challenging the status quo. And um, so what we discussed was that right now the system is very hierarchical. And so, which means that everything is kind of one dimensional. It kind of took to what I was discussing before around knowledge inequities that we take Western model and we try to, we push them from the top to down and to the civil society. And so one of our collaborators mentioned that um, the idea that civil society will be the one making the changes is not really realistic because they do not have the power. And also that while we're having that conversation about uh, funding mechanism, power is not just about the money. Like I was saying before, it's just like, it's about the processes, the norm, the structure, it's about ways of doing that are imposed and come from a single lens of um, thinking. So one of the solutions that was discussed was invite more officials. We need to be able to have this conversation in the presence of top level decision makers, which are the UN um, government donors, but also um, officials from the countries we're working in. Uh, another approach um, that we discussed also was, we need to see value in different ways of doing things. Um, we're talking about especially valuing community and how the way fundings are being organized right now is very often focused on a single unit. We think about household, when you think about individuals, when working in an environment where the community is more important. And so one of the things I was talking about was if we imagine, instead of like thinking about a project in terms of like one household, we were thinking like a million pe person, people that we're gonna cover, we think about like two villages, and just thinking about how do we make sure that that unit is functioning because that's what that's how people live and so in order to do that we really need to think about the way we design our intervention from the perspective of the people that we're going to help and rather than thinking about our understanding of the world and um, it goes back to uh, diversity and inclusion in um, the funding mechanism, but also the structure that are organizing like the international development space. 
because I think when we talk about collaboration, for example, we forget that like even within a collaborative environment, there is power structure that are very strong. Um, as an African woman, I've been trying to I've been trying to work with like other African countries and always thought, oh, I'm an African woman, the African people, it is fine. But then I realized that I'm an African woman with an LSHM affiliation and um, have Western education. So there's still a power imbalance there in the thing that I can do and the thing that I can impose. And so I think it's very important for us to get into those collaborative approach with just how do we tone down our power and just make sure that we create an environment where the people we work with, they feel empowered and they feel comfortable sharing their vision of the world. And how do we unlearn and are able to listen? Because sometimes you would hear something and you think, this is not how it should be done, but it's not about us, it's about the people we work with. And so that's what we discussed. Making the system, like the system is very stiff, how do we break it? And uh, it's about what we do, it's about who is in the room, and uh, it's about how we think about our ways of doing, not from a position of dominance, but for a position of like plurality of knowledge system, rather than like superiority of one and hierarchies of knowledge. Over. Thank you, Emily, a lot in there, and I'm hoping our note takers have been capturing it all. I think we're also recording this because I think there's a lot that we want to pull out from, from what you've summarised from that really fascinating conversation. Um, we are coming to the end of this session, and uh, I think there's been an awful lot that we have learned or beginning are beginning to learn about where we can go forward from here. Um, and, and recognizing that this is a huge transforming the, the system is a huge task um, but looking for the, the kind of green shoots the directions that give us hope are, are, is really important to that task so we, we want to go back I'm hoping the technology will work um, and before we um, close out today we want to ask you one question from from the whole of the session that we've had we'd like to ask you what disruption or disruptive practice have you heard about today that you would like to know more about or to see put into action. And just to let you know, out of this session, we will be putting your inputs and the discussions um, into further learning. Um, and we'll hope to be able to share, share some outputs from the session with you all and with the wider community. Um, as a final reflection, uh, I feel that we've, we've looked at change at a number of different levels. Some of them I feel you know, our, our improvements to the current system, but I feel that where the weight of interest is, isn't actually about uh, a revolution in that system um, and, and how that might be brought about and, and looking for, for where we need to change our practices, our thought models, our cultures. Um, and obviously that's that's a really challenging area. I, I feel that we we probably make quite substantial progress over the years to come in, in making hopefully improvements to the existing systems but we need to be very intentional and conscious if we want to try and achieve the, the, this transformation that we've been discussing today. Um, and it'd be great to kind of carry on that conversation about how we can facilitate and work together to, to achieve that. Um, and I believe there's an opportunity to carry on contribution to this um, using a, there's a bond working group, I hope you all know bond, um, on catalyzing locally led development where I think we can continue this stream of conversation. We encourage you to engage in that session. Um, well, we won't close this at one, but I, I'm going to now say thank you, a huge thank you to our panellists for their really thought-provoking contributions. And a big thank you to all of you uh, for taking part in the discussions and sharing your examples um, and your thoughts. This is hopefully the start of a longer conversation. I've really enjoyed it and I hope you have. And finally, thank you uh, to Alna for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion um, as part of their brilliant series around uh, disrupting humanitarian system and the power in it. So really, um, really enjoyed it. And hopefully this will be the start of, of more to come. So thank you all. Um, when you have finished typing your, your response, please feel free to leave and maybe go on and join another session. <laughs> but thank you.